There have been a couple of faked attempts to show the shadow on Earth created by a solar eclipse. First was by EPIC on Deep Space Climate Observatory, a satellite apparently launched by SpaceX and an heliocentric orbit one million miles from Earth. Let's look at this image a little closer. It looks exactly like the image textures NASA provides on their site. The shadow is conveniently over the middle of nowhere, and why don't they show the stars? They say it's because the camera exposure is set for the brighter Earth, but it would be simple for them to take two pictures, one of the Earth, and then change the exposure and take another picture with exposure settings appropriate for starlight. They are definitely familiar with compositing, so that should be easy and would provide the first ever picture of a planet with the stars in the background. Here is a 2006 total solar eclipse over Turkey and Cyprus. NASA claims this was taken from the ISS about 240 miles above the surface. Looks to me like around 80,000 feet with a model overlay. There are some planes that can fly at these altitudes. For example, NASA and the Air Force are the only two users of the SR-71, a plane with an altitude record of 85,000 feet. Now why would NASA need one of those? Here is what it would look like from 29,000 miles with an 80 millimeter lens. The yellow line connects the sun to the position on Earth where the sun would be seen directly overhead. The gray line connects the moon to the position on Earth in the same way. Notice how the sun is catching up to the moon's position and eventually overtaking it. After releasing this first clip, I got a few comments about the Earth not appearing to be spinning. This is because the camera is connected to the Earth, so it is spinning with it like holding a selfie stick and turning around. The only visual indication that shows the Earth is spinning is the background stars. From a ground perspective, the Sun takes 24 hours to go around the Earth because of the Earth's counterclockwise spin when viewed from the top. The moon appears to take on average 50 minutes longer than the sun to make that same revolution around the earth. This is why the sun is always catching up and then passing the moon on a new moon and solar eclipses. This can easily be verified by viewing the moon two consecutive nights and noting the time difference. To show the earth spin, I've attached a camera to an imaginary line between the earth and sun. Shadow starts to appear over the west coast of America and moves to the east. I will slow this clip down and play it again and also zoom in on the earth so you can see the shadow better.
Next is three ground views along with the view from space. All locations are on the line of totality or very near to it. Top right Salem, Oregon. Bottom left Princeton, Kentucky. And bottom right Tiga Kay, South Carolina. To show the Earth spin, here is what it looks like with the camera fixed in space. The Earth appears to move away from the camera quickly at first, but that is just the effect of distance. The further away an object is, the slower it appears to move. The solar eclipse works in a very similar way on a flat stationary Earth. If you take the Sun's known apparent angular diameter and calculate its distance with a 40 mile diameter Sun, it will bring it close enough to create a solar eclipse when the Moon's distance is also adjusted by the same method. The main difference to the globe model is the presence of a larger penumbra area on the flat model. This could be due to the close Sun and Moon. Next is a view from a stationary camera 12,000 miles above the surface. The path of totality is a little south compared to the globe model. Changing the sun's assumed size from 40 to a 39 mile diameter would lower its altitude enough for the shadow to follow a more northerly path. Next is a view with the camera connected to the sun's motion and then panning around it. The moon and the sun are both very flat spheres. The moon is not very easy to see being flat but it is visible passing just below the sun. Search my channel for moon shape to see how a flat disk looks through a refractive substance.
and here is a ground view from near the path of totality.
takes about 70 minutes from the first contact to the second contact. And during that time, I will admit, it's like watching grass grow. To entertain yourself, one of the things that you might do is to bring something with, with little holes in it that will project little crescents of the sun. In March, we asked to borrow the spaghetti colander, and the cooks thought we were a little nuts until they saw the result. The other thing is to remind yourself that those that didn't travel to the eclipse site are only seeing what you're seeing now and not what you're about to see. The interesting visual experience begins about two minutes before the eclipse. And there's a number of things you should be looking for. First, shadows will start becoming very sharp. Next, start looking for the shadow of the moon. This is going to be easier to do if you're in the west. In the east, the sun's going to be much higher and the shadow's going to be much more diffuse. Next, look for shadow bands. True confessions, I've never seen them. Look around and see what the animals are doing. In 2001, the cows started heading home to be milked, even though it was the middle of the afternoon. Finally, notice the temperature. If you're further east, the eclipse is going to happen later in the day, and you should notice a noticeable drop in temperature during totality. Things happen pretty fast, so I've taken screenshots from my video on Svalbard and highlighted things that you should be looking for. First, notice how the leg of the tripod has a fuzzy shadow. Well, that's normal, because usually the sun is not a point source. The rays from various parts of the sun come in at different angles and consequently each cast different shadows, all of which are fuzzed together. Just checking the camera. As totality approaches, the shadow gets sharper because the angular size of the sun gets smaller. Also, we should start seeing the moon's shadow. That, after all, is what causes the eclipse. A little closer now. The shadow is getting sharper and the sky is getting darker on the right. We're now within 20 seconds of totality. Look how sharp the shadow is now, and look how distinct the shadow of the moon is. Those of you in the west coast can try putting out a sheet and see if you see shadow bands. I've never seen them, although many people did in Svalbard. The moon's shadow is now hiding the sun. Totality has begun. Notice the shadows have completely disappeared on the ground, and the moon's shadow is very distinct in the sky. The August 2017 eclipse only lasts for two minutes, so therefore it's important for you to think a little bit about what you want to look at, and there's a lot to look at. I'm going to focus on two areas. First, what you can see unaided, and second, what you can see with binoculars. In Russia in 2008, I didn't bring binoculars, and so I was ended up looking at the eclipse just with my eyes, and using a camera only for wide angle. Whether you use binoculars or not, it's important for you to look around. Here's some things to look at. First, notice along the horizon. You should still see a little bit of light. After all, you're in the moon's shadow. Those parts of the sky aren't. Many people say to take a moment to look for planets. In Russia, Mercury and Venus were visible. On the west coast in 2017, Mars will be above the sun and Mercury below it. Both are likely going to be dim. Venus will be about 20 degrees further in the direction of Mars. As the Sun travels to the east coast, the orientation of the planets will change. Mars will now be on the right, Mercury on the left, Venus on the extreme right. After C3, turn 90 degrees to your left and look southeast. You may be able to see Jupiter. The corona is perhaps the most unique feature of a total solar eclipse. After all, prominences can be viewed with a hydrogen alpha scope. The corona is only visible during an eclipse. You can get a satisfying view of the corona with just your naked eye. However, I think binoculars will do better. The shape of the corona varies greatly from eclipse to eclipse. Here are some examples. My photographs from 2001 show an almost uniform corona with few bright flares, although some heavily processed pictures do show more detail. In 2015, there were a couple of bright flares. There was also a lot of visible turbulence in the corona. As I remarked on the audio track in 2016, the corona was the most unique that I've seen, with delicately curving structures and a bright flare. The 2006 corona featured two flares on opposite sides, forming almost a square. Unless your eyes are incredibly better than mine, you're going to need binoculars to see prominences. Prominences are the other neat feature of the eclipse. You can see prominences in a hydrogen alpha scope, but there they're pretty dim. 
Here they will be the brightest phenomenon. For you binocular users, make note, there is a safety issue involved in looking at the magnified sun. We'll talk more about that when we get to the discussion of C3. As I describe in my series on photographing solar eclipses, cameras don't really do eclipses very well, and so the pictures I'm going to be presenting now are not going to be a good representation of what you're going to see in your eyes. They're going to emphasize the prominences which is useful for this discussion, but remember when you're looking at them yourself, you're going to see corona at the same time. The challenge in doing justice to the prominences is to pick out all of the unique features. So for this picture it shows a disconnected prominence. A small piece of prominence is broken off and is heading out into space, as well as a couple of more normal prominences. Here's a photo from Easter Island in 2010. In a typical eclipse, you will only be able to see prominences right after C2 and right before C3. However, if the prominences are especially large, then you can see them throughout the entire eclipse. Let me magnify this image by a factor of two. Notice the loop. Prominence loops are one of the interesting features to look for. Here's a photo from 2006. Notice the prominence that looks like a hand with a raised finger. This was visible in the viewfinder of my camera, so it would be easily visible in binoculars. Finally, this one from a ship off the coast of Liberia in Africa. This was a unique eclipse. The eclipse was short, consequently the moon was small. It just covered the surface of the sun. As a result, prominence is visible throughout the entire eclipse. I got so wrapped up in looking at the prominences, I actually forgot to look at the corona. Finally, the last thing to look for, and you can do this with your naked eye or with binoculars. The sun is like a big bar magnet, and like any bar magnet, it has magnetic lines of force. You're probably all familiar with the simple science experiment where you make the lines of force visible using iron filings. Well, the lines of force are sometimes visible in the corona as well. Not every time, but there's something to look for. You can see them here on the top and the bottom of the sun. For those of you looking at the eclipse through binoculars, it's back to safety. The eclipse is about to end, and you need to know what to look for so you can protect yourself. When you see one side of the sun covered with red, that's the warning. It's time to look away right now. The bright surface of the sun is about to be exposed. Put your binoculars down and enjoy the diamond ring with the pure visual observers. It's okay to look at it for a second or two but I wouldn't do it for longer than that. The danger to your eyes is growing second by second. So that brings us to the end of our video on watching a solar eclipse. Remember, this is going to be an experience that you'll remember for the rest of your life. The more detail you can pick out from it, the better and richer the experience is going to be. By now, I suspect you're wondering where to go to see the eclipse. Well, I addressed that question in part five of my series on photographing solar eclipses. That section talks about the weather prospects at various sites. Enjoy the eclipse. It will be an experience you will remember forever.